What is up guys? Today's video, we are going to be talking about how to test buy. I get this question all the time. How much of an online, how much of an ASIN should I buy initially? Uh, how can I avoid price tanking? All that kind of stuff. And in today's video, I am taking a clip from the Side Hustle Experiment podcast. We sat down with Duke Does Amazon, and we literally just had a 12-minute just all about test buying, how we test buy. We've all sold millions of dollars combined on Amazon. So you're basically getting how seven-figure sellers um, test buy for their Amazon business. Drew even goes into a formula he uses in his business, how to really protect your upside downside so much. I was listening to the podcast again and I was like, I need to clip this up because I get questions all the time about test buying. How many should I buy? You know, that then this is really the secret to growing an Amazon business and scaling it up is the willingness to test buy. And we cover all that in the video. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Check out the full episode of the podcast. I'll link that down below along with past episodes and enjoy the video. I will say, just to reiterate, in order to get become an expert at a handful, you have to try hundreds, you know? But once you start getting a taste, I always say like adjacent, pro you know, I never find one product from a winning site, never one product from a sale. There's always more, you know? So once you get a taste, go hard. Yeah, yep. and I think that's a big proponent too. And I know we talk about all the time is like the idea of test buying. And like Drew talked about that in his video too. And I think a lot of people would say, oh, like, you know, everything tanks or this and that. It's like, I don't care because, like, I'm not going deep in a lot of stuff. I'm buying 10 of something. Obviously, there's a place in time. I just keep four. I've bought multiple hundreds of one ASIN. But, again, there is a place of time for that. But usually during the year, I'm not going super, super deep unless there's I have knowledge of a sale or, I mean, I talk to Jonathan and he's like, hey, or Drew, like, hey, I've sold this before. Like, this is what happened last year. There's no guarantee that happened this year. Right. But there's just more context on it. And I'm like, okay, like, I'm good with this. And I think that's where a lot of people, in my opinion, fall short is they see us or, I mean, that's going to sound bad or whatever. But they're like, oh, like, they must have a secret. Like, what are they doing? Or how yeah. are they successful and it's just basically like we just like threw our heads against the wall and like tried stuff out yeah. and test bought and i mean some of the keep it charts and stuff or asins i'm on no one would ever buy it if you go by conventional wisdom right because it doesn't look like it sells it doesn't have a rank it or the rank is really bad but it sells a ton and the keep it charts not reflecting that either and I, that's why i think test buying is so underrated and it's like, you're literally, you're, if you're not willing to put up a hundred, 200 bucks to find out if you can move five to 10 of these, you're at a huge disadvantage because there's been listings this year where I did that and I've lost money, but there's also been ones where I've made thousands and thousands of dollars and it way outweighs that. And everyone's like, oh, yep. like, when should you test buy? Like, just do it. Like you literally have nothing to lose. Like worst case scenario, maybe you lose five or 10 bucks in ASIN. If you only have 10 of them, 50 to a hundred bucks. I'm not about wasting money or something like that, but I look at it as research experimentation as an investment in the future. If you're having trouble wrapping your head around that, like maybe look at it that way. Like you're not wasting money. You're yeah. trying to figure something out. Um, so that's kind of how I look at stuff like that. You're buying information. It's a numbers game. And I don't think this ever gets talked about. Actually, I was thinking about if I were to ask anybody who I respect as a seller, anybody, I, I'm thinking about myself. I would imagine that 10, 15% of my products at any given time, I'm selling for a break even or a very tiny loss. And I'm fine with that. I truly don't care because at the time I made the best calculated decision I could, things will change. Sometimes you take a chance on a risky thing. Sometimes you think, hey, the upside's there if my stuff gets checked in quickly, you know, but like, that's just, that's just part of the game. And John, I know, cause we've talked for anybody listening, like something, a very simple way to do it. I like to weigh my worst case and best case. And if you really don't know Keepa, worst case scenario would be what is the lowest this has ever sold for in the last year, right? 
that's like a true worst case. And you can look at just like what the buy box was just without getting too in depth, right? And if you're okay with the downside being, I lose five bucks on 20 units, but if I cat the, if I read this right, I'm making 20 bucks on a unit, I'm taking that risk reward all day. And by the way, there will be times you can do everything right, read it perfectly. There's unforeseen things that will happen. The longer you do this and the more products you have, each one means less and less to you. So it's not a big deal. It is literally just part of the game. Get your cash back and your rewards, make a couple bucks if you break even. But like, that's just, that is part of the game. And that provides valuable information. Yeah, it, to parlay off that a little bit, I, I have like an equation that I teach people a lot about, like coaching people on that exact thing of like your downside and your upside. And mine is, let's say a product, the, the worst case in the keep a chart is negative 20%. You want to look for a 3x multiple on the upside. That's what I try right. to look for. So a 60% ROI yep. upside. And then if it falls somewhere in the middle, you're good. But that, that's what I try to, like, that's the, the minimum of stuff I kind of look for there. And I, that there's no data behind that. And there's probably, if you extrapolate it down, maybe that does make a lot of sense, but that's just what I've always went for. And I never end up losing like a significant amount of money. Cause I'm either playing with a minus 10, 30% upside or like a, a 0% or whatever. Like I try to play around that area. So my test buys are very calculated, even if it's completely yeah. random item all in, all together. Totally. And by the way, if, if the seller counts skyrocketing and prices tanking, like I can't expect to do anything beyond the worst case scenario. Like you shouldn't even be buying it, but I understand there's times you don't fully understand Keepa, right? Yeah, so yeah. that's just like a nice safety net. And actually it's funny, I, I was thinking about, I, I was thinking about that recently because, you know, sometimes if something costs me $5 and I can make $10 if, if I catch it right, but I, I really can't lose, I'm, I'll go a hundred deep. No problem. Like, especially if I know it's moving, but like it's, you get in trouble when you spend $40 on something and then it's not as fast a mover as you thought. And the downside is there and the up, the upside is I bought a hundred of a $40 item that my best case scenario is making 10 bucks profit, right? That's where you get in trouble. Cause you're not creating okay. enough cushion for the inevitable things go wrong, right? Cause things will go wrong. <laughs> the, the perfect the example of that is Q4 toys. Like everyone yeah. thinks that they're going to bet on these toys and then make yeah. this money. And that's like, you just laid out that scenario. It, yep. The toys, the betting on toys for Q4 is so stupid. Like your upside is 30, 40% ROI. Exactly. Absolute best case scenario. And your downside is minus like 70%. So that, that bet is so non asymmetrical. That's like the opposite of what I, my equation of you just taking a massive downside yeah. for no upside. So yep. you have to, the, the toy stuff, that's just a, I see people talk about that one all the time. People want to do that because it looks so, well, it sold out last year and it's going to look good. You can't play that game because your downside will wreck all your upsides. And if you, if you take enough 70% and 60% yeah. losses, you're not even making money. Yeah. Like you're losing no. money, especially because those losses are going to get returned. That's another huge percentage of loss you take. Yep. It's just, if you don't play that right and know your numbers like that and know going into it, what you expect is going to happen in your worst case better not be that bad. You're just getting up running a break, even an unprofitable business. This is kind of funny, but you know, when I really thought of this as like a real life uh, metaphor, I was Thanksgiving shopping, right? And um, I was doing grocery shopping. I was like, I was buying potatoes and potatoes are dirt cheap. So I was like, you know what? I'll buy two bags. Cause if we have too many, I know they're going to be eaten, right? And it's not going to put a hole in my pocket. My worst case scenario is very minimal. Contrarily, I'm not going to buy 10 extra pounds of beef tenderloin. I'm going to try to gauge it exactly because, I mean, I would eat it all. But you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like it's a very high, it's a high risk, low reward type of thing versus potatoes. People love potatoes. They're going to buy them. People can be very happy with potatoes. So, like, I'll spend an extra 99 cents a pound. And if I have too many, so be it. You know what I mean? You know, just as like a fun real life example, I literally had a light bulb moment. I was like, this is just like Amazon. When it's high high reward, low risk, you, you triple down. When it's low reward, high risk, I'm not saying not to get it sometimes, but like you don't have to go as deep. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's like where a lot of people get caught too is like you're talking about is like you take – 
I feel like some for some reason I've thought this when I was starting. It's like that sellers that were further ahead of me were taking these risks because you'll hear every once in a while, it's, oh yeah, you could take ten percent, like you're compounding it, this or that. I'm like, this is exactly what this person is doing. Yeah. Like they're taking, they have the opportunity to make, you know, twenty dollars on this ten percent ROI thing. Like they were talking about this, and before you know it, everyone gets on, and now you're instead you're making. You're looking at losing twenty dollars on this, and right. it's just a total mind shift. Like shift is that I feel like no one thinks about the upside downside and kind of what. And I've been on buys this year where I've doubled down, and I lost all the gains because I misplayed it or other people caught on, and it was just like, damn, like you should have just been happy with what you were able to get and then kind of move on with it. And I think it also goes towards laziness, right? Like who right. wouldn't want to, of course I want to buy a hundred of an ASIN because that means I have to buy less of something yep. else, but it also puts my business at a massive risk to carry, you know, just to have like maybe 10 horses in the race instead of having a hundred, right? I have a better chance. Obviously there's at, at a given time, like there are definitely ASINs that totally drive my business, but I always need to have potentials in the mix and always be test buying and trying new things. If I, if I, the few times I buy a hundred or just as a large quantity, I am so confident in it. The only thing that would get in the way is essentially Amazon removing the listing, which could happen. But like, yeah. if I'm getting to that point, because not only you're spot on, I think people that aren't quite there sourcing, it's like a hundred items. These look good. I can hit my spending budget. I'm good. Like I could be done. Right. But also think of, talk about compounding. Not only are you diversifying, if you buy 10 different items, 10 different units of each, now you're going to get feedback on 10 items. So like if six of them are good, now you can double down on six, not just bet, bet the house on one, which oh, in, the short, in the short term might be an advantage. But if I have knowledge on 10 brands now, or like, you know, over the course of a year, 120, you know, like that's going to oh, versus 12 long term, that's going to win all day. You know what I mean? So it also makes you a better sourcer because now you have to say, I'm not, I'm not allowing myself to put the, to put the, you know, bet the house unless that right time calls for it, which it does. Um, I'm going, even if I think it's right, I'm going to spread this out because I understand I could be wrong, you know, and that's, and that's going to force you to find more better products. It, it, very important as well because as the people don't like to say this, but as the market becomes more saturated, which it is because more people are selling and the margins are getting squeezed. This happens in all businesses. Like the margin will keep going down and going down. I, I don't foresee a future to where we're going to be just finding 80% ROI items all over yeah. the place. Like that's just what happens with all businesses. So the more that it gets squeezed like that, the more important this stuff that we're talking about is, which it's late into the podcast and people might have even turned it off by now. But this is like the most important part you can take about Amazon. If you don't consider these testing different things and compiling this data and trying to find these little edges, you're going to play a losing battle because that it's just way more competitive. Like if you have guys like us doing that stuff, how are you supposed to compete? Because it's just yeah. not going to be possible.